Express it. No, it's fine. We're getting there. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. Then the next phase to be such a first phase be such a stuff. The first one is right. Mhm. Now I was everything I got the first day. You had? I don't know. I mean, it's possible we've we've swapped things, and it happened a lot. Like last year, we kind of ended up swapping, like in the notes. So oh, the notes said this. If there's a mistake in the notes, you know the drill. Ask for, uh, tell us to revise those things, right? Because you're not mar like if there's an assessment, <laughs> the grading is not based on whether you you conform to what was in the notes. It's it's based on whether it's it's the correct thing. Right, so the notes. If there's a mistake, what were you uh, talk about? The, go back to the R format instruction. Where was the conflict? Source register number one, source register number two. Yes. Oh, you are placing the RD after this. And I mentioned this, if you remember. I said you have to be very careful. I know where this is coming from. You go here and you're like, aha, RD, RS. They have to follow this. No, it's not how it works. This is not how this thing works. Do you know why this, is, this has to be? Do you know why there's this obsession on, 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 on the instruction format? Do you remember what? This, uh, there's a very important component we discussed during the fetch decode execute cycle, and, and I'm taking us back here. We'll get to the, I guess, the real reason we're here just in a moment, but I just want to make sure people understand what we're doing here. But do you remember what the, the core components in the, uh, in the, uh, oh, this is nice. In the, um, that was nice. Lenny's supposed to be fun, right? <laughs> we should smile. People are always not smiling here. But, but the thing is, do you remember our discussion of the components in the C, on the CPU, the core components on the CPU? Can we say some of them? What do we find on the CPU core? No. Hmm? People will be saying we weren't asking us questions. What do we find on the CPU? Okay, yes? Control unit, what else? Register. Registers. Right, now I want to draw us back to the control unit. Do you remember what some of the functions of the control unit are? <clears throat> Can you remind us? Thank you. Now that, there are plenty more, right? I mean, it has to figure out um, Things like, uh, oh, what's in the IR register, right? The, 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 well, CIR, I guess, IR, uh, current instruction register. But decoding of instructions, what it's doing is it's decoding that stream of 32 bits. And in part, what the decoding involves is trying to figure out what operation must be performed. You can only know what operation will be performed, as is the case with the uh, MIPS architecture, if you look at the first six bits. Now, if it was decoding this instruction, what is it going to do? It's going to look at the first six bits. At, at this point, it doesn't know exactly what operation needs to be performed, right? And you notice once we discuss the data path that once it looks at the six bits, it knows that this is an R format instruction. If it knows that it's an R format instruction, then it knows that the last six bits will dictate what operation must be performed. Once it checks the opcode and it, it figures out, say, it's an add operation, then it knows um, then it, it tells the ALU to say this is an additional operation, so you need to add two numbers, and the ALU expect two operands, and you know, this is why we're doing this. This is what's happening. And, and I, I'm saying this because last time people were asking about the software program and whatnot, and I sat there and I thought, there's something wrong here, right? Again, I'll, I'll reiterate this for, for the benefit of those of us that didn't understand or don't still understand. 
the instructions we are talking about are related to a computer program or a piece of software. A piece of software is obviously written, designed, and implemented by programmers, right? Hopefully some of you in here will become that. A simple program perhaps could be, um, this is a bit good, come, but uh, just, I, I just want to see if this will work here, right? I don't do this as often as I should, but hopefully this will work. Um, Now, uh, sorry, I was going to use a you fail, you pass kind of thing, but <laughs> uh, hopefully this works. Um, can you see? I think you can see. All right, so I just wrote a simple program. It's just like, a, it's just like something that you design. It would, it's much, complex, much more complex than this. Usually these days, these are like um, UI-based applications where you have like some graphical user interface that um, facilitates interaction, right? User and this piece of software. This is a simple thing, right? Let's say, you designed, it's not me, it's you implemented this simple program that asks a, a, a ICT 11, 10 student or a student in the School of Education, enter your CA, and then they enter, say my CA is five. It will tell them whether or not they passed, and then they enter, somebody says, oh, it's 55, and then they pass, right? The thing is, this program that you would have written has a series of instructions that you specify in a high-level programming language like this. The machine does not understand this, we say this. Because I'm using a language that is interpreted, there's an interpreter that translates the equivalent of this thing here into machine code. The machine code that are translated, in fact, it's not like they're translated line by line, by the way, because this is a high level programming language. So it's entirely possible that the resulting instructions, if you had to dumb this down to assembly language, for instance, you have a lot more lines of code than the seven that you have here because this is, it's abstracted, right? What we're trying to do is, because we want to understand how a computer works, we wish to know exactly how a computer interprets these things. And what we started doing is we started looking at, let's say the equivalent of this was, uh, uh, um, let's say it was uh, one instruction, for instance. This is what we are studying, what happens to it. How is it formatted? How does a computer understand this? Because it doesn't right now. This has to be converted into a form that the computer understands. Right? Uh, and, and also, I, I did mention that uh, the so-called understanding of, of this computer, obviously, it's, uh, what we're looking at is the so-called MIPS architecture, which is different from um, your everyday machine, like what I'm using right now. So hopefully, this makes sense now. Right? Um, OK. So if there are no questions, then we proceed. We, we looked at an example of uh, an immediate instruction. And granted, we also know now, uh, having looked at the green card and having looked at that, the de facto book that we're using for this particular lecture series, um, we realize that there's a whole slew of, of um, instructions, R format and R, uh, I format instructions, a whole bunch of them. We just narrow down on one example just to see how um, these different segments um, are used. Specifically, op code six bits, um, destination register five bits, source register five bits, the next 16 bits are reserved for the immediate value, 
right? Um, work through an example. We'll also work through an example, which is pretty trivial. It's an example from the test now. We, you know, this is second nature, although the test was converting. We are going back there, right, for the test. And we're only told to convert them into this value, this value, and that value, and that, I think. OK. <clears throat> so next up is the last, um, the last instruction format, the MIPS architecture. Um, uh, so the format is pretty easy. This is J format instruction, typically used when uh, the instruction involves jumping to a specified location in memory, right? Um, and I think the only the only instructions that are there as part of the MIPS instruction set is just the J instruction and the jump and link J A L, right? We'll look at examples of these once we start looking at the code. Don't worry, it makes sense obviously, right? And so opcode. And then the label that specifies where you're jumping to, or a specific address where you want to jump to in memory. Right. Um, I think the jump and link is a classic example of, of um, a J instruction that's used when you're making function calls. I could be wrong, but I think so. Um, uh, you can you can you can use you can decide to use the J instruction to do uh, what they call an unconditional jump. Um, if you don't want to use a B instruction or branch, branch if equal, branch if not equal, something, right? But essentially what you're doing, partly what you're doing is you're controlling the flow of the program. There are certain times when you write a series of instructions and you might only want to execute a particular part of that program if a condition is met. So you skip some code segments by jumping or by branching. This is what we mean by control or controlling program flow, right? And the simple example that I used, in case you are wondering, <clears throat> in this example, I'm controlling flow here by using this if statement, if that condition do this, else do this. So what was happening is if I entered, when I ran this and I entered a value um, that is um, greater than, greater than um, 22.5, then Program control, greater than 2.5, program control comes here, right, and says you passed. But if I enter a value that is um, less than, less than, uh, less than 22.5, what happens is, uh, comes here and then it checks, say one is, is certainly not greater than 22.5, it should be like a force, right? And then program control come here, because there's an else statement, right? If you woke up early, come to class. Else, don't come to class. I don't know if this is. And most of what we do is logic, right? The stuff that we, this is what makes this interesting, actually, in my opinion. It's like, uh, it's based on logic. It's just pure logic. Um, hopefully, this kind of makes sense, guys. <clears throat> OK. So an example here is just a jump loop or something. Um, this is wrong here. It's just remnant of what was before, should correct this. Right, so just to remind us that the first six bits is for the operation. And similar to the I instruction, the operation here is not zero anymore. Why? Because the only way we'll be able to tell uh, if this is a J format instruction is if we're able to make sense out of the six bits. Which is why unlike the R format instruction which has all zeros, all J instructions will have a number here, an actual number that makes sense, not a zero, a number other than zero. And if you look at the MIPS, uh, the green card that I shared on the Moodle that only two people bothered to, to, um, to go through, you will notice that uh, the J instruction, hopefully that thing has the stuff I need. Uh, J instruction, where are you? What? They don't have. Can anyone see a J? Oh, there we go. You see uh, J is a jump and link and jump, right? Um, jump address. This is what I meant here. If you look at this opcode slash func code, you notice that the, oh, the J instruction, which is this thing here, the J instruction is hex number two. The jump and link is hex number three. So you already know, right? If, if a question came to say, uh, 
you are given some some reference details at the end, like in the appendix section, tells you to say what instruction is uh, uh, what instruction has an opcode of two. All you have to do is convert it if the reference card has all zeros, and then you're able to figure out that it's a J instruction. So two would be what uh, zero 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 one zero, right? That would be like your J instruction. Hmm? Uh, zero, zero, well, zero, 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 one, one would be your jump and link because it's hex three. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Yes. There's no opcode. The slash, the, the opcode slash func code here is there for the benefit of the R instructions, which have an opcode of O0. What this thing, they're trying to make it compact. What, thing is, what this thing is telling you is, if you have a zero slash number, then you know this is an R format instruction. So my question is that, uh, like an R format instruction, <coughs> if you give it, if you store the space, so the first number is uh, the opcode, and the second number is the next is the function, right? For what, for a J? Uh, yes. Yeah, and, and typically, like if this was like part of an exam for the benefit of the exam, exam, if this was an exam, the appendix section would have fun code or code is this. Do not memorize this for the purposes of this particular course. Don't memorize add what is the code. You'll be wasting your time. You will be given in the appendix, if there's a question that requires you to write an instruction, you'll be given details to say the add instruction takes in these particular things. If you've, if you've looked at past test uh, assessments, you've noticed that they were given an appendix at the end. Yes? It would depend on the question, actually, yeah. Oh, yeah, so in this case, yeah, if you want to translate this to equivalent machine, a uh, format that the machine understands, this would have to be binary. But using six-bit representation, <coughs> Why does it have to be six-bit representation? Because we know that the opcode for MIPS formatted instructions are always six or six. six. Okay. Is this making sense now? Thank you very much. Hope it's making sense. And hope it's uh, even more interesting because it turns out that learning is much better when it's more interesting instead of uh, <coughs> forcing matters, right? You're here because you have to be here because they told you at home, mom and dad, go to class. No, we must come because it's interesting. I always try to make it interesting. I don't know if I, I make a good attempt at doing that. Probably not, right? No? I try to excite people, right? But I, I don't know. Uh, but uh, so just as an example, um, if, if we were to use like a J loop, for instance, this would be our label. We know that the six bits will conform to the instruction, which is J here. If this was J A L, this would be like J A L, right? And then the loop would just be the, the label in this case. Um, this is this is provided. This is always available. It's set in stone. There are details about the mapping of uh, hex equivalent or binary equivalent of the J instruction, right? So we just look at the um, the reference information, and then you'll be able to figure out what this is. This would depend on, um, because this is dynamically um, uh, evaluated, obviously, so you won't really be able to know, uh, not until you execute the instruction. Right? Uh, so obviously, you convert this to uh, uh, binary using 6-bit representation. You convert um, this address to 26-bit um, representation as well, and then you end up with that, and this would be like the equivalent machine instruction. And, and in fact, so if you wrote a program, uh, let's say in Python, and you converted it to assembler, and one of the resulting uh, instructions in assembler is this, for the machine to, to know what to do, you need to use um, an assembler, right, to assemble this into machine instructions, and the machine will be able to interpret this. And how does it do this? Assuming it's implemented using MIPS architecture, it looks at one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, the six bits is a nine zero. So I know it's not an R format instruction. It's, it has to be either an I or a J format instruction. But it knows that uh, uh, zero, 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 one, 
zero is a J format instruction. How? This is going to be decoded by the control unit, right? And then boom. Now, just to tie the different pieces together, guys, uh, I thought we'd just do a comparison of the, because we're saying, we've been singing about, you know, MIPS being, um, having a fixed format. Uh, all instructions are one word long, 32 bits. Um, so just, as, I guess, broad overview, high level overview of how these bit, bits are actually used in the different instructions. You know, it is for R format instruction, first six bits, opcode, next five, register, source number one, source register number two, next five bits, uh, destination register, uh, next five bits, shift amount, only applicable for if an amount requires shifting of bits, usually not the case, but sometimes it is like shift left logical, for instance. Last six bits, very important for the R formatted instruction. Why? They, this last six will dictate what sort of operation needs to be performed. Yes. I have again. I'm sorry if I swapped the two. If I swapped them, we shall have to. I did actually. No, did I? No. When? No. Here, have I swapped them? No, it's written RS and RT, but you said RT is RS. Oh, you mean when I was? Yes, so I'm thinking like. Synchronization, I'm sorry. Uh, don't know what's happening here. I haven't drunk uh, coffee yet, I guess. But now, that's an excuse. I'm sorry for the uh, error, mistake. Uh, for, for the I format instruction, again, six bits for the op code, uh, next five bits for register source number one, um, five bits for um, these changes here. This is going to be the destination register, but it's still represented as RT, right? It's a fixed format, which is why this has to somehow conform to the format. It has to fit into the format used by R instruction, which is why we can't say this is RD, right? Which is why they decided it can't be RD, but it's RT. And then the last 16 bits is the immediate value, the constant. J instruction, pretty easy, right? Six bits reserved for the opcode, the next 26 bits for the target. Now, very soon, uh, once we start looking at the data path, we'll gain an appreciation, we'll revisit the sign extend how this is reconciled to have 32 bits. I gave an example last time. And also, how this register, because the register has to be, this value has to be 32 bits, but if it's 26 bits, how exactly um, is this converted into a, uh, a 32 bit value? We'll look at this during the, the thing. Uh, but these are important decisions that people had to make when they were coming up with a specification of how this thing would, would have to be done. And in fact, you can decide to come up with your own specification, your own instruction set. No one can stop you from doing that. This is what people have done, right? This is how we ended up with different specifications. MIPS, x86, ARM, I think, or ARM. And these are all different specifications. But the problem really comes in uh, because whatever specification you're, you're coming up with has to conform to the hardware. Because fundamentally, this vocabulary or this instruction set has to be used in conjunction with a piece of hardware. Usually hardware manufacturers will design their hardware based on a particular instruction set. Which is why, one of the reasons why most machines would be x86 based uh, machines. People have gotten used to that particular instruction set. Hopefully that makes sense. Now just to, I guess again, this is, copy paste from a reference data card, and I guess you find this information online. This information is also in that book that we are using. So I thought I'd, I'd kind of remind people that uh, different types of uh, instructions, and so you notice that uh, you have different, you know, opcode based on whether it's an R format, I format instruction here, just the usage in this case, uh, fancy things. But you notice something common for R formatted instruction is um, this notion of them having an opcode of zero, right? If you are feeling adventurous, you never be asked about this in the exam because this information is provided. I do encourage you to look at, just explore some of these instructions, right? So that you have an idea of what exactly um, they do. Uh, we're just going to restrict our discussion to things like basic arithmetic operations, flow control. Perhaps we'll look at procedures maybe um, 
So the reason I'm saying you want to just go and look at this is just to enrich your mind because we won't cover some, we won't look at some of these things. Uh, like for flow control, for instance, we just look at things like branch if not equal, branch if, if equal, I think uh, unconditional jumps, for instance, the B instruction and whatnot. Right, so some of these things we won't look at, like the O and O R I. Um, okay, a lot of them actually. This is by no means comprehensive. This is from last year. I thought I'd ask people, now that we are getting into the thick of things, I thought I'd ask people just to see if we've been following here. Uh, oh. the, the, the add instruction, right? It's an R format instruction. Would we say this piece of code here makes sense? And by the way, just assume line number one up to six makes sense, and line number 10 makes sense. The question is, these instructions here, line seven, eight, and nine. Is there anything strange about these things? And if there is something strange about these things, what is strange about these things? Uh, group, group one. Yeah, that, that adds one, one mistake. One mistake. Okay, boy, whatever. Okay, group one. Yes, what, are, what else is wrong here? Nothing, group one? Oh, that's still group one, yeah. Same as him, group one, no? Same, yeah, I mean, I just said, I mean, this doesn't make sense, right? If this is an R formatted instruction, you can't have um, an immediate value here. It takes in registers, all registers for add. Right? Okay. So, so I mean, just to, to really, try and uh, see if we can, again, gain an appreciation of how these instructions actually work. Um, I thought we'd look at some, some things that, are, that we are familiar with, like adding and sub subtraction. We'll start with those easy things, right? So um, a very common thing that you tend to do when you're writing programs, um, or when you, tr when you actually do convert the programs back to, uh, when you convert them into machine representation is typically there's there's a lot of um, arithmetic operations being performed by the ALU, right? Um, uh, and so I just have an example of a very basic addition operation using a high-level programming language. Right? It's Python in this case, version three. And what, what I'm doing here in this example is I'm saying I've de defined two variables that are going to hold values five and seven. And then I implicitly declare or define a variable C that's going to hold the result of adding A and B. And you notice that when I print C, I get a 12. The reason I have included this is trying to set the stage for what we are um, we're going to look at when we're trying to come up with a representation of this in assembler, right, using MIPS in this case. Right, so you notice that for us to mimic what we have here, if you're adding two numbers, if you want to add two numbers and put the result in and store the result somewhere, you notice that the first thing you need to do is you need to load the numbers that you're interested in adding. In this case, it's five and seven. You have to load five. So because MIPS is register-based, before you perform the operation, the things that you want to manipulate or work with must be loaded into registers. In this case, if you want to add two numbers, five and seven, both of these numbers must be added into registers before you work on them, right? So you load five into a register, you get to choose which register. Um, safe register range is always the best, uh, uh, the, the best, the safe registers, the, the registers in this safe range are the best to use. So T naught up to, is it T50, T8 or something, I think, is it? Or register eight to 15, right? And there's also, is it 24 to, and 25 or something? I don't know, don't have to memorize these things. Um, see here, I'm not memorizing these things for the benefit of those that and then following what we're saying is safe register range. We want to add, for, before we add two numbers, we must put them in registers. And what we're saying is you want to make sure that you, you work with the temporal register range. Always a good idea. You could work with the saved registers, right? The S's, the, those with S's, which are these here. This is fine, but these are mostly for, like if you're working with functions, right? Uh, so you can choose to use 
registers 8 up to 15 or registers uh, 24 and 25. I've gotten used to just using 8 to 15 myself. Um, and also, the other thing is you can, you can choose to you can choose to, um, and I think we, we might, might as well use this for, we might as well, this is the time we have to use what we are trying to do here. And it's not stop it, it's not program with a, two M's and an E, no. It's program with no E, this is how you spell it. Don't do that again, you know yourself. Now, um, let's say we, we're trying to program to add two integers. Five and seven, right? We're saying the first thing we need to do is we need to load, we need to load these things. We need to load them into registers. We want to add these two numbers and print the result. <clears throat> first thing we need to do is load, load first integer into register. Load second integer into register, right? Perform operation, right? And then that's it. This, these are the steps we'd have to do for us to add five and seven, right? Um, and we said uh, we can take advantage of, um, even though we, we kind of introduced the uh, load immediate instruction, but we can take advantage of the add i, i formatted instruction. Why? because it turns out that the add i instruction takes in a register as an operand and an immediate value. So we can take advantage of that, that fact and add or load the number five into a register. You're not restricted to using eight all the time. If you wish, you can use register 12. Start with 12, nobody cares, right? But I prefer to start with the lowest register. It's much easier that way. So load the first register the first integer into a register, we use the add i instruction. We said I'm going to load it into register number eight, <coughs> excuse me, and we are taking advantage of the add i instruction because we know that we can use the special purpose register zero, which is always zero, to add it to the immediate value because we know that the next operand here is going to be the immediate value five, right? At this point, I know that the Operation I'm performing here is just five plus zero. Five plus zero is going to be the number I want to load, which is essentially what I'm doing, right? So five plus zero, I've loaded the number five into register number eight. Um, so I've performed that operation. And then next thing I do is I say add i again. I take advantage of the add i instruction. And I say I'm going to load this in register number nine, right? Same format, uh, uh, register zero, and then the value seven. And then finally, I perform the operation the add operation, because I'm trying to add two integers, five and seven, I'll just add the, uh, two, the, the two values in the registers. My two values are now in eight and nine. Five is in eight, seven is in nine, and I'm going to add them. But I have to make a decision of where I'm going to put the result, right? And the result, I'm just going to say I'm going to put them in, in 10 because I know that the temporary register range is from eight to 15, right? So I'll add, I'll add the value in eight, and nine, it doesn't matter, you can start the value nine and eight, it's still gonna be the same, right? I guess the, the thing here that it would be a bit, it would be important for you to make sure that these are not swapped if it was a subtraction operation. But if it's an addition operation, it doesn't matter. One plus two is the same as two plus one. One minus two is not the same as two minus one, right? So I will save this, and I decided to do this because we want to get used to this idea of, of writing code like this. I will save this, I've written my instructions, I will save them into a file that I will call uh, add example or one. Now you want to give it, a, I guess, a, a, an easy to remember name, not add example one, right? I'm just saying for this example, it's add example number one because it's an add, you get the point. And then more importantly, I give it an extension like that, that we've agreed on as convention, right? ASM or A or S, right? You're better off with ASM. I do encourage you to use ASM. And then I'll save this, right? So I've, I've written my, my small little uh, piece of assembler, assembly uh, language program here, um, which just adds two, two integers, five and seven. 
And then what I will do is I will now have to, I need to have an assembler, right? And the, the only assembler I have access to is through Qt spin here. Uh, and by the way, the windows here, I'll get rid of the floating point registers, a bit confusing here. Can anybody, see, everybody can see this, hopefully? The people at the back, yes. When you're sleeping, don't. <laughs> Dozing, saw you. Now, so I will go to file, initialize and load file, nothing wrong in sleeping, and then I will select the program that I just created, right? And by the way, do this right now. Uh, I think these are working. You want to try out these things as I'm showing you these things. I think these are working. Go to where we normally go. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Go here. You can copy the code there. If you want, you can write it from scratch. We are, we are pair programming here, so you can, as you, are, you can copy this from here if you want to. Um, just paste it. And you go there by, <clears throat> you access that thing that I'm talking about by going here. Right? You'll, you'll be able to copy the code from there. So I've loaded it here, and you notice that when I load it, right, so a bit of interesting things are happening here. When I load this and I look at the user text here, you notice that the stuff that's loaded here excludes the comments. What I'm loading is instructions from line number four up to line number four, seven, and 10. Do you know why? Line number four, and I, I need to reload this because I added extra, extra piece of code, I think. I need to load and initialize this. So five, eight, and 11. The only things that I've loaded there is five, eight, and 11. Why? Comment, comment, blank, comment. Blank, blank, blank. I said this. I said comments are ignored by the assembler. Blanks are ignored by the assembler, which is why the things that are loaded in here is just the important instructions that are going to be translated to the machine equivalent once we assemble this program. Right, so <coughs> we've loaded this, and, and I also want to draw your attention to the registers that we are manipulating because effectively the state of the CPU is going to be changed by, I mean, when the state of the CPU changes, just the values of the registers that we're manipulating are the ones that are, are going to change, right? So we expect the value in register number eight or register T naught to change, register number nine or T one to change, register number 10 or T three to change. T not T1, T2, sorry, not T3, right? These are the values, T, T, yeah, eight. I've recorded this, go to YouTube, go to my channel, subscribe, like, please now, but <laughs> I also dump the, the things on, that's what they say, right? Please like and subscribe and whatnot. I'm, I'm talking about, I'm deliberately saying, I want you to remember that eight, can also be referred to by saying dollar sign T0. Nine can be referred to by dollar sign T1, register eight, register nine, register 10, T2. If I wanted, that program could just as well have been written by saying add I dollar sign T0 or T0, comma dollar, dollar sign, not the zero, but dollar sign Z-E-R-O. This is one and the same thing. Do you understand this? So I've loaded this program, the most important thing, and you notice that these registers, right, eight, nine, and 10, initially, the initial state of the machine, this simulator, I've just initialized everything. Everything is zero, right? Except for the special purpose registers like A1 and the, pro, the status register. But once I execute this thing, right, and, and we mentioned this, if you do F10, I guess you can do it stepwise. Please observe what's happening if I, stepwise is F10, I think. Does anybody know? I want to step through the, okay, save 10. So I want to step through the, the code so that you see the state of the registers changing. I will press F10. Ooh, sorry. What the? Whoa, what did I do? I hope I didn't do anything wrong. Okay. Uh, F10 is supposed to be function 10 here, not just F10. So I'll press F10. I've, I've, so I'm stepping through this. Once I step through it, you notice that 
first instruction I've executed, right? I just didn't press the play button, I'm stepping through. You step through the, when you step through the code, <clears throat> right? When you step through the codes, it's a single step, you're executing the, the chunk of code you've written one at a time. And we're doing this so that we understand how the state is changing on the CPU, right? Uh, so first line has been executed, the state of register eight changes, the value is five now, right? Uh, I will step through again, the value of uh, register nine changes. And then I will finally execute this, um, and then the value of register 10 changes. It's finally C. Seven plus five is C. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. No. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Seven plus five is C, right? I, and mom and dad will think you are crazy when you tell them they told us there's this crazy lecture told us that five plus seven is C. C. There's a question. Yeah. Uh, so typically, it's, most of these is um, as as you as you, you start, as you start to write more complex code, there are certain things that become more important. For some programs like this, I don't need to define um, the data segment because I'm I'm not working with any data that's in memory, right? But if I was, I don't know if people get the question. It's, it's a very important question. It's saying. We forgot to, I apologize for that, we forgot to include these things. And by the way, my, my editor has syntax highlighting because it recognizes assembler, right, Kate. So if you want to work with Kate, I encourage you to use that. I don't know if Notepad does this, which is why these are color coded. Registers are always going to be in orange and then these are in blue. So the reason is simple is because this is like a very simple program we really, uh, where the, the, the assembler just assumes that the instructions that it finds is just going to execute them line by line. But the labels would be important if I had other procedures defined besides the main label. Because the, the main label you're referring to, by the way, the main label is there because, the main label is there because you could potentially have uh, something right below the main, it says uh, add, oh, yeah, add function, right? Where you define code that's going to add, to generate code that's going to perform an addition of operation, and then when you want to use that function, you call it within the main label. This is where it becomes important. You see it once we discuss functions. But the reason I did not include the directives, the data directives and the, um, the data directive and the text directive and the globe directive is just because it's okay. You can get away with it. I've changed it. I'll reinitialize this. <clears throat> In case people are wondering. Yes. No, I was, I was clicking F10. Just F10. F10 is, uh, what I could have done is, so I've initialized this, you notice everything is zero here, right? What, uh, normally what people would do is you write your chunk of program and you just play, run, right? You click the play button, run. And then it's going to, and by the way, that error is coming up because I didn't properly exit the program. Um, which it doesn't matter, but I, I could do that, I guess, just now. Uh, so that the thing doesn't come up, but it doesn't matter, we we'll discuss system causes. So what you typically have is, um, Normally when you write your piece of program and you, you assemble it like this and you run it, you, you run it by just, place, just pressing the run button, display button, the green button. What that does is it executes everything all at once and then you get the result. We were stepping through the code by going to, I'll reinitialize this again, I'll re re reinitialize the state of the machine. What I did was, is this a step one, I guess? No, it's pause. There's no shortcut for, oh, single step. So what I was doing is I was pressing F9 as a shortcut, but what you can do is if you want, if you want to use one of these buttons here, right, if you want to use this, uh, this toolbar here, you can use the button that's uh, right beside the help menu. 
the one that has the numbers alongside it with the lines, yeah? you see this? So if I start stepping through single step, right, changes. Like single step, next line is executed. I was just trying to show how the state of the machine changes as we are stepping through the code. You continue step, stepping, you restart from the beginning, right? And then things change and whatnot. Is this fine? Well, we used I because we want to take advantage of how the I format instruction, the add I works. So, okay, how else do you think would uh, load the instruction based on what we've discussed so far? How else would we load the number five into a register? Yes. Load immediate, yeah, people remember the, the pseudo instruction load immediate. There's no load immediate, though, but it's a load immediate pseudo instruction. We could have done that. What he's saying is, uh, to answer your question, we did it because it happens to be the most intuitive way of loading values into a register, but there are other ways of doing this. What he's saying is, in line number 11, observe, instead of having add I, we just have load I, like so. One and the same thing. If we reinitialize this, now I want you to pay particular attention to what happens if we reload this, right? <laughs> if you look at line number 11, which has our, our, our load immediate instruction, which is here, right? Line number 11, load immediate. Eight. You notice that it is, in fact, because it is not a bare, a MIPS bare instruction, there is no such instruction called load I as part of the MIPS instruction set, the original MIPS instruction set. This is a pseudo instruction. Because it's a pseudo instruction, it must be converted to its equivalent bare instruction, which is um, all immediate. And you ran away from add I, lo and behold, all immediate does the same thing, right? And I mentioned the all immediate. What does it, does it bitwise, it's a bitwise uh, all operation. And I think we discussed this in EDU 1020, what all and do not, yes. Yes, you did that. How, how, how else have you been creating formulas? I like showing people things. Can I show you something real quickly so that you... Uh, so let me show you something real quick, right? This is, you, it probably won't blow your mind because some of you obviously know this. But, but the, way, the way, you know, when these years are compiled, right? It turns out that when you have a whole bunch of... Um, when you have a whole bunch of, uh, uh, ooh, it's gone. Oh, gone. Turns out that when you have a whole bunch of uh, things that you want to do, the, you use, I mean, you use formulas, obviously, discuss formulas, and sometimes when you're working with numbers, you need to perform conditions. You know, like, uh, just, I guess we just use, we just use this. This, uh, I'm showing this because we're, I'm trying to show you how these things are linked together. Everything is connected, grand scheme of things. We are all connected, they say. Okay, fine. Uh, I'm trying to showcase an example where we have... Uh, doesn't matter. So if you look at how this thing is computed, right? How do I figure out whether this is a test three was a D plus, a D, or a B, for instance. Formula. And if you notice the formula, this formula I'm talking about here. I don't know if I have O's, but I probably have an AND or something. I don't have an AND, it's a bad example. But it turns out that, the, that these things that we're discussing are used all over, right? In, in Excel, like if you're, there are times when you might want to compare to, <sighs> If someone, I'm trying to use O, O, and we'll discuss, maybe we should discuss and, I guess, at some stage. But, but in, 
What an O operation would do, like in Excel for instance, is it will compare two values, two conditions. If any of those conditions is true, then the result will be true. The AND operation compares two values. It will only be true if both of those values are true. And if you, know, if you kind of think about this, right, that's, this idea is really powerful. This is the same idea that is used uh, with the, uh, the bitwise O operator or bitwise OI operator. Whatever, whatever numbers you're working with, they're converted to the equivalent binary format, and then the O operation is performed on each of those bits aligned, one to the other, right? One O zero is one, because one is true, zero is false. One O one is one. Zero O zero is zero. Zero O one is one. This is what you do in, in Excel, right? Sorry? Yes. Oh. The commas. Yeah. It's a it's a convention. This is how the instruction is formatted. This this is this is how this is how you get this is a specification. This is how you get to write this uh, so instruction. Point. There will be an error. And this is important because when you're assembling the program, right? This, this thing is, it's, it's, it's automatically uh, translating my, I don't know if it's my edit or if it's the way Qt spin works. But ideally, the, the syntax, it, it, you have commas there because the syntax says you should have commas there. But I think what my, what my, what my, uh, what Qt spin is doing here is if you notice line number 11, it assumes that uh, after load i and then you have, it knows what the load i instruction does. And so when it sees the register, it knows that there should be a comma here. So even if I remove the commas, they will be put there for me. But the commas are there because it's part of the syntax. You know, so usually, again, the, depending on what sort of programming language you're using, it will tell you exactly how, what sort of syntax you should follow for you to write syntactically correct code. Otherwise, it won't compile. In this case, we just like it actually it does work. Right? So commas there. OK. Um, so that's for adding, right? Uh, and this is essentially what we we're just walking through here, just trying to see how the state of the CPU kind of changes the registers themselves. Um, I don't know what I was doing here. Right. Yes. No, but I gave examples last time. You can, you can use hexadecimal as well. But, but you know that uh, for, for, for this particular example, you need to make sure that your hexadecimal number is prefixed by a 0x. That's how, that's how the assembler is going to know that you're working with a hexadecimal number. Um, but for the most part, um, and this is interesting, you know, I think it's based on conversion. For the most part, when you're writing these programs, you typically work with something that is more intuitive to you. Even if we've learned, we've learned how to use hexadecimal numbers, but what is still natural to you are decimal numbers. If you've gotten to a stage where you understand hexadecimal numbers way better, you could have done this, by the way. It works just as well. Uh, what is five in hexadecimal? Sorry? Are you happy now? Yeah, you're happy that the question has been answered for you. Yeah. So you, yeah, you can. So you can do this, right? Um, so this is like, I guess. I don't know. Why don't you load it? Does it? The answer is still C. Five plus seven is still C. In fact, the answer zero x five plus seven is still C. 
to still be C. The answer is C. The answer is also not C, but uh, it's also um, <laughs> this is 10. The answer is also uh, 1100, right? My God. But the, the reason it's, it's shown as 1100 here is uh, even though the number is represented in, um, it's, it's represented in using the two bit representation, but because you have 0000, zero, 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 zero the zeros are truncated for you. Right? I just thought I'd mention that. You can switch this, this simulator to show you results in decimal if you want. The answer is 12. If it's more intuitive for you, or in hex, in which case it shows you the values in hex. Is this making sense? Yes. So what about the O R I nine eight nine eight? What about the O R I? What about it? Uh, well, so this is, this is because I have another instruction that, um, that issues a system call so that the program properly exits. Uh, could you just give us a few minutes, please? Thank you. You, you notice that uh, I, have another, I, have, I have another instruction in my code. I, I, didn't want, I was trying to avoid that error. It's coming from here. It's coming from here because I have the load immediate here. I, I didn't want to, if I, if I remove this, and you notice once you start discussing system calls here, and I load it and, and, and I run it, there's usually this error that comes up. I mean, you can avoid the error and just say okay, but I was just trying to avoid that error essentially. So I gracefully exit the program. Now I just wanted to leave us with, uh, uh, because we're adding today, just to leave us with this notion that we've, this idea we've discussed before, um, that you can actually perform with this these very basic concepts, you can actually perform more complex operations, like add 10 numbers, or add three numbers, or four numbers. If you can add two numbers, you can add four numbers, right? The only thing is in MIPS, uh, while in, in high-level programming languages, you can easily just define variables to hold these values and then just add them like so, but in MIPS, you cannot do this. It has to be stepwise, right? So you typically have to go through a process where you load the values you want to add, maybe because it's addition operation, you can just perform them, evaluate them left to right. So you load five into register eight, two into register nine, for instance, um, and uh, seven into register 10, and then you add the values in register eight and nine, get the result, put it in 11, and then you're going to add the result in 11 with what you've put in 10, and then you get your result. It has to be stepwise. Yes. Could you, just, could you quiet down, please? That's rude people, right? Horrible people, cheaters and horrible people. That's what they are. They cheated a lot last year. They're bad people, right? Uh, sorry, yeah? No, they are. They are, they are very, it's, it was very sad last year. There's a bunch of cheaters in that, that group. Horrible group. We can talk about this afterwards. Uh, guys, I'll see you on Monday. It's a bad, there are bad people in this world, right? <laughs>